clear back there? Yeah, we're doing fine. Yeah, I'm good up here. Nice big engine bay. Oh boy. Talk about a marriage made in horsepower heaven. Chevy's last full-size rear-wheel drive muscle car and GM's first big block from a box. The 502 is only the second non-production GM Performance Sparks motor and, well, 20 years later, it's still a big choice for guys who just want to plug and play when it comes to motors. Not too long ago, we got the point. You see, after we gave our 85 Monte Carlo a 9-inch rear end, upgrades for the suspension, brakes, and exhaust, not to mention a trans conversion from factory automatic to 5-speed, Hey, we were glad to forego the engine build this time and use the crate motor. And when it was time for the payoff, man, that 502 engine more than made the mighty Carlo live up to its nickname. And later on the dyno jet, it proudly produced 420 plus horsepower on the rollers, 515 foot pounds of torque. So you're probably asking yourself, why did those idiots pull that motor out anyways? Well, good question. See, some of our power block neighbors have been bugging us to let them use it for one of their project vehicles. Now, we hate to see grown men cry, so we're going to let it go. But we are going to build something different for it. And in a way, it's the Chevy version of a big block project that came out of the blue a few months ago. We challenged ourselves to build a Ford 460 on a poor man's budget of less than $2,500. Some parts reused, some stock replacements, all good enough to make a cheap blue oval bullet worth 378 horsepower. But hey, we didn't stop to pat ourselves on the back. We launched a stage two build with a big cam, performance heads, single plane intake, and a thousand CFM carb. The payoff this time, 607 horsepower. Well, this time it's Chevy's turn in the spotlight. And for a foundation, how about this 454 short block that we found had machined and rolled in here for two buildups. First, a bang for the low buck buildup and see how we compare with that Ford. Then we're going to take the gloves off for a high performance build and see if we can meet or beat the 460 numbers. For the budget build, we cleaned up these cast iron heads, then went into the Summit catalog for a bill sheet of affordable parts, well, like these pulleys, aluminum intake manifold, basic dress up kit, and a hydraulic flat tappet lifter and cam set. This thing is a replacement for 67 and up Chevy 396 to 454 cubic inch engines with an operating range of 25 to 5500 RPM. Now, duration of 50 thousandths is 228 and 238. Well, next to go in are the hydraulic flat tappet lifters from our Summit kit with plenty of lube on the bottoms where they contact the cam lobes. Then a stock replacement double roller timing set. But wait, we haven't talked about budget. For the old motor, we shelled out $250. Then our machining bill came to $700, and we spent $1,350 on parts. So we're at $2,300, which is about $200 under the Ford budget. Yeah, refurbishing these old cast iron heads is one way we save so much money. Now, these things are an open chamber design, and well, that basically refers to the size and shape of the combustion chamber. Closed chambers were kind of bathtub shape. These kidney shaped, and they went to these in the late 60s for improved fuel economy with lower compression as a trade off. In their 27 year run, 454s were rated as high as 460 horsepower in the early 70s and as low as 230 back in the mid 80s. We're using ARP head bolts, and what we're doing is putting thread sealing on the threads and then some ARP assembly lube on the upper part of the threads. Now we're doing the sealant because our water jackets are open and not blind. The balancer's next, and we got this one from Pioneer for our big block Chevrolet. But if you remember correctly, the Ford was a little different. They used a two-piece balance assembly on the front of the crank snout. The first piece to go on was a cast counterweight that got sandwiched in between the harmonic dampener. Now Chevy did this. They use a counterweight that's installed in the center of the harmonic dampener to balance theirs. Needless to say, it's the same results, just a different path to get there. Our water pump is a cast iron mechanical from O'Reilly Auto Parts. Then a pair of chrome pulleys for the pump and the crankshaft. Now we can cover our stock oil pump and pickup with a GM replacement pan to finish the bottom end. Last but not least, a Mr. Gasket oil filter adapter. And we'll finish the rest of it in the dyno room. Meanwhile, I can't help thinking how cool it's going to be to get this burgundy beast back on the streets. 
And when it's eventually time to drop the motor in, things are gonna fit like a burger in a bun. Same headers, same linkage. We'll even use those motor mounts. After the break, we'll have our burger on the grill and see how much sizzle we get on the dyno. You like them pork rinds? <laughs> We're back and about to see which budget big block produces the most power. Months ago, we built a budget 460 Ford big block that made an impressive 378 horsepower on our dyno. Today, we built up its Chevy counterpart 454 with a used short block, some fairly basic budget parts, including a hydraulic flat tabbit cam and valve train setup, plus a dual plane aluminum intake manifold, all for around 2300 bucks. Well, we're getting really close to seeing how this bow tie motor stacks up to its blue oval counterpart. Any predictions? Man, you always put me on the spot. You know, these things are built pretty identical. I'd be scared to say, but I will tell you this. I think they're going to make within 20 horsepower of each other. I bet the Chevy guys are hoping there. Yep. Well, they've got a shot with this Mallory HEI distributor that has a billet housing. Plus, we're using a set of their Pro Sidewinder 8mm wires. To keep the playing field level, we're using the same 750 CFM Summit carb we used on the Ford build. Oh, burn it up. All right, Joe, you want to give it, uh, fire it up? Now, since it's loaded with a hydraulic flat tap and valve train, break in oil and some run time is mandatory to avoid scarring the camshaft. Purring. Good oil pressure, smooth running, that's all we need. This old Chevy might have something for that Ford. Here's a little horsepower history on the 454. In its pre-1973 glory days, the LS6 version was factory dynoed at 450 horsepower. The Ford 460's top advertised horsepower was 365. After five gallons of gas, we dump the break-in oil and fix this small but annoying leak. Let the battle of blue and orange begin. Think we'll make the Chevy guys happy or not? I hope so. Let's see. I like when everybody's happy. Three eighty-four. Three hundred eighty-four horsepower with five hundred twenty wow. foot-pounds of torque. Surprise, aren't you? That's only the four grand, Joe. I know. Let's make a 4,500 volt. Oh, 407. I'm liking these numbers. <laughs> I can't believe them. I'm liking these uh, this, this motor is ready for five grand. And I bet you Blue Oval fans are ready to kick the TV. Take art though, I'm partial to Forge myself, but you got to hand it to this 454 combination. Steady. 409, but it may have peaked out. Well, maybe not, but that's enough salt in the wounds for one day. After crunching the numbers, here's how the two budget big blocks stacked up against each other. As you can see, Chevy runs away with it. 31 more horsepower than the budget version of the 460, and ironically, 31 more foot-pounds of torque. That's two motors with just about the same size block and similar parts packages. It's going to make Stage 2's build up even more interesting. You see, next week, we throw away the budget, tear down that 454, and build it up with high-performance parts. We'll see if it meets or beats the Ford's top number of 607 horsepower. Hey, coming up, a celebration of cool nostalgia racing and hot rod heroes. Don't miss it. Hey, want to know what's best about the good old days? Well, if you come to Bowling Green, Kentucky once a year, you can see it, hear it, and even smell it. It's hot rod reunion time, and we're here for a blast back to the past. This is where it's at. I mean, this is where you racing is supposed to be now. He could be right. Fans of all ages eagerly invaded the midway, packed the wooden grandstands, and immersed themselves into the glory days of hot rod racing at this fundraiser for the NHRA Museum. Talk about living history, you get to see up close the famous cars from the past and meet some of the people behind them whose winning weapons were skill and grassroots ingenuity. 
you couldn't buy horsepower back then. I mean, you, if you wanted to have something new, you had to make it or evolve it yourself. The old time racers come to reminisce and mingle with the fans who watch them race into the history books. Hey, without the fans, not too many people would have heard of Sox and Martin. In the 60s and 70s, the Sox and Martin race team dominated the Superstock Eliminator class. A few years before his death, I met Ronnie match racing Bob Reed at this Mopar Madness event in St. Louis and got to witness that legendary four-speed power shifting prowess of his. Of course, it was equally neat to meet his old teammate, Buddy Martin, here at one of their old stomping grounds. One of few races here, I bet. Well, I don't, I'm trying to remember <laughs> if we won or we lost. It, it, I, you know, usually wins stick in your mind, so maybe we didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about what people are saying about the economy right now. There's a record number of cars here for this year's show and shine. In fact, there's so many nice cars here, it's gonna take something really oddball or just flat out over the top to get your attention. As always, a mixed bag of classic, restored, and modified machines line the rolling concourse. But neither a slick street rod nor a caddy convertible could draw a crowd like this oddball entry. Some things that people come up with. One freaking Lincoln. And the owner showed both a sense of humor and imagination to create many of the parts, from the super tall intake runners on down to the square tube headers. So what's our over the top pick? Well, it's gotta be this sleek and low 69 Mustang Mach 1 built by its Georgia owner and his son. It's section three inches, chopped two inches, has a, a 428 Cobra Jet, Tremec five speed, torsion bar front end, Mustang 8.8 .8 rear end. Whether you like or not, you're probably going to look at it. <laughs> like a drug, you know, you, you, you get addicted to it, you can't quit. <laughs> well, over 400 addicted racers came to compete at this vintage track, and nothing gets the crowd going like a blister and run by a front engine top fueler, like this one driven by Adam Sorokin, who's following in his father's footsteps. The front engine car, you know, I, I wanted to drive a long time ago because that's what my dad drove, and uh, I wanted to experience that. And once you get in one, you really don't want to get out of one. The only thing in common with its old school predecessor is the tire size and engine location. To Adam, though, the thrill of a six second pass is still the same as ever. Everything's perfect. You don't do anything except hold on, you know. But when things are bad, or if they shake, or if they, you know, if they want to get out of there, then you got to do some work. At the end of racing rounds on Saturday, there's always the traditional cackle fest when the flames from nitro-burning vintage race cars lights up the Kentucky sky, filling all eyes with nitro tears and filling everyone's minds with wonderful hot rod memories. Build on a budget. Horsepower projects that save you time and money. This week's budget tip is dirt cheap and should spark your interest if you want to follow the lead of all the top fuel and funny car engine builders. Plus, it's a tech trick a lot of other guys overlook. The tech is indexing spark plugs. Now the result is a plug that delivers the best possible flame front to the center of the cylinder. When a plug is not indexed, the ground strap can get in the way of the flame. The explosion is late and not directed to the quench area of the combustion chamber. You can see how this can affect performance and efficiency. Indexing each plug puts it in the correct position for the fuel air mix to ignite and force the boom back into the quench area. We picked up a set of Excel indexing washers for less than 15 bucks. Now they come in packs of 30 with three different thicknesses, 10 hundredths, 21 hundredths, and 31 hundredths. Now the indexing washers are different thicknesses so you can index the plug in the correct location. The first step is to mark the plug to locate where the open gap is gonna be in the cylinder head. Thread the plug into the head and tighten it to 10 foot pounds. 
This is the exhaust and this is the intake valve on this particular cylinder. Now we want the open gap to face towards the center of the combustion chamber, slightly favoring the exhaust valve. And if you take a look at the black line, this one's not. All of these kits come with an instruction sheet that'll tell you how many degrees of rotation each washer is worth, starting from 310 all the way down to 100, which is what we're going to use. Same cylinder, exhaust and intake, and we're using the smallest washer we had, which seems to be a little too much. But don't worry here, all you need to do is back it off and retorque it a few times. What that'll do is crush the washer and put us right where we need to be. There it is. The only way you can screw this up is if you mark the spark plug in the wrong location. Now these washers come for both conical and flat seat plugs. The one thing you need to worry about is only use one per plug, don't double them up. Now the benefits of indexing spark plugs can vary from engine to engine, but don't be surprised if you notice better idle characteristics, better fuel economy, and even a little more power out of your ride. Not too shabby for 15 bucks and about an hour worth of your time. Plus, if top fuel engine builders do it, don't you think you should give it a shot? It is totally amazing how many different types of motors we've built in the past year or so. Well, like the classic Olds 455 here, Pontiac 400, now that was a good one. And what about this little beast, 401 cubic inches, made over 500 horsepower. Then of course there's the 572 big block, but probably the most popular, most efficient of all has to be the Chevy LS1. And if you've got one in your street machine, you know what I'm talking about. But if the clutch behind it is, well, let's say, taking early retirement, you might want to employ one of these. It's a street strip replacement kit from Hayes that features a diaphragm pressure plate, organic disc, and of course, the handy installation tool. They'll accept a standard throwout bearing, and like all Hayes clutches, designed for reliable, long use. So to get more performance out of your LS car, you'll have to spend about 480 bucks. Well, it's no secret that airflow and performance go hand in hand. The secret is to design a filter that flows well, but also does the job of filtration. Now, these Spectre horsepower proven filters do both. They've been designed and tested to deliver up to 10% more fuel efficiency and filtration 100%. Well, they're also cleanable and reusable, and you can find one for your application in the Summit catalog. But don't forget about next week's show. It's stage two for the 454 buildup as the battle of the Ford Chevy big blocks wages on.